Well, good afternoon, Peter. Good afternoon and to you. And thank you for coming to uh, participate in our project. Um, it's an oral history project called Life Stories, which has been organized by the local Germans from Russia Society. And i um, really pleased to have you here with us today. It is March the 18th, 2017. And just to introduce Peter, he is a retired school teacher who has agreed to be interviewed. And his history in Europe, uh, his family's history is uh, based in Volinia and in Germany. So um, I think we'll just begin. Um, perhaps you can tell me something about Volinia. I know you weren't born there, but do you have any memories at all of it? You well, because I was born in, in East Germany, uh, all I have to go on is the stories or the references from my parents. They mm -hmm. talked often about their, their childhood, their teen years, uh, the escape from, uh, the living of the vi life in the villages. Uh, they came from a village which I think was called Nazdrybia. Now, those of you who know more about Poland or whatever may be able to locate that. I haven't been able to locate it on any map at all. But it was a German village, uh, and I think that was the, the, the standard back then. There were villages that were completely German, completely Lutheran. The church was the center of the community, and uh, mom and dad lived in that area, Nazdribia. Um, and they talked about uh, the poles uh, around the area, outside of the town. They, were, they didn't live in the town, is, is my impression. They didn't talk very nicely about the Poles. They referred to them as uncivilized or uncultivated, as dangerous. Especially my mom had stories about one must not go to the uh, dances outside of town because that's where the Polish people are and you don't want to go there. So what I'm trying to say is that there was one characteristic that I remember of, of uh, my parents living in Volinia. Uh, is that there wasn't a whole lot of friendship between the Poles and the Germans. Mm -hmm. And that would be one characteristic I think that uh, other people could uh, concur with. And have you some idea of when, when your father came to Poland from Germany? Uh, or I'm, am I right I, in I, saying I, that? Did he start in Germany, then move no. to the Volinia area? No, his grandparents moved okay. to, the, uh, to, to the Volinia area. Uh, I think in 1917, okay. right around there. Mm -hmm. That's that's my impression. Um, and uh, both mom and dad were born in that area in Poland. Um, uh, they ended up in Germany because uh, my impression. I, I'm historically kind of uh, at a loss here, but uh, my impression is that they left Poland forcefully when the Germans um, were re retreating from the advance of the Russian forces. That's basically what Mother talks about, that she had to lead the team of horses, her... Let's call it her ugly sisters were on the back of the back of the sled or the wagon, and Mum had to jump off because of the mud and the snow and everything else, and lead the the, the two horses uh, westward towards Germany. And I think they moved not because they were you know unhappy with living in Poland, but because the Russians were coming basically. And were they German so speakers was, in Poland? They were German speakers in Poland. Yes, right. and, and they then, they I mean they were bilingual. Um, and then forced out of Poland back yes. to Germany, back to where Germany. you were born. Yes, and um, Mum's brother had uh, met a lady in a town in Germany and had married her, and so their destination was to meet where the brother was now living. So they had someone to go back to in Germany. Correct. Yeah. And how did they communicate? Uh, I guess by mail. Like, they didn't have cell phones or... No, they didn't have <laughs> I think the only way would be mail or uh, other visitors, other people mm -hmm. traveling there or traveling from there, back and forth. Uh, but they knew that Uncle Benny was in, in Germany and that was where they then headed uh, into Germany. did you have other siblings? 
did I have siblings? Mm -hmm. uh, we eventually had uh, a family of six, uh, five boys and one girl. Are you the eldest? I am the second oldest. Okay, so there was another someone that your mom was bringing out of Poland back to Germany. No, we were all born in, in Germany. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, well all the, the first three of us were born in Germany. Then when we came to Canada, three more were born mm -hmm. in Canada. So there's... Uh, uh, but as far as uh, other mem memories that I have, or distant traces of stories, I guess you could call them, uh, Mum talked at one point, uh, yeah, there's several stories that come to mind right now. Mum talked at one point where she was sort of sitting and reminiscing uh, about how much fun they had as young people in the uh, fields at harvest time, where all the, the villages, young people, there would be various villages and they would come from the various villages to help with this field and then the next field and, and so on. And they'd work. Uh, through the night. So they'd start, uh, in you know, 8 o'clock in the morning or whatever it would be, and work all the way through the night. And during the night, especially, uh, romances would bud. And so it was, it was and she, she got all sort of, uh, kind of, kind of misty-eyed and so on about how beautiful it was and how they'd all sit around uh, taking breaks from the stooking uh, and sing songs and hold hands and maybe even dance a little bit. So I think from her perspective, life in Poland was nice until the war happened. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, like I say, there was some tension there between the Polish uh, people living in the area and the Germans, but still it was a very, very warm... Uh, and which war are we talking about, Peter? Uh, World War Two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. There's an, another one I wanted to talk about. I'm not sure exactly how useful this will be. Dad, somewhere along the way, I would say in the 1930s, uh, became a Baptist. Now, everyone in the village was Lutheran. Dad became a Baptist. And so he was an outsider. He was a, um, a weird duck. Uh, he took great joy in being a weird duck. Um, um, he thought about becoming a minister at one point, um, but he, he stood out. His, his, his faith, his Baptist faith, set him apart from not only the Poles, not only the Germans, but almost anybody else uh, in the area. He was a very... What do you think uh, caused that to happen? Uh, him becoming Baptist or mm -hmm. the ostracism? Mm -hmm. No. Why did he choose to be I think there was, other than Lutheran? <laughs> what we're getting into here, I think, is the, uh, the ages-old sickness called family. <laughs> and so I'm sure that, uh, that Dad was, um, just from putting things together, was not well-treated in his family. Uh, there was a death and then a remarriage. The remarriage uh, caused all kinds of tensions, and I don't very I don't know many details about that, mm -hmm. but that is something. And so then Dad was an outcast from his family, uh, and part of the expression of his being outcast was to become a Baptist. I see. I, I, I'm what work sure. did your father do? He was a farmer. He mm -hmm. was a farmer in Poland, uh, and um, <coughs> but he he was self-taught. He could. Speak he could read and write uh, in English and Polish and Russian. He became a bit of a teacher, uh, especially uh, in the church. Uh, he was a bit of a leader. He, um, um, yeah, he, even when he came to Medicine Hat, he seemed to be a, a leader uh, mm -hmm. amongst the church. A strong individual. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, um... What do you remember about your early years in Germany? <laughs> I was, I was, I was born in, in uh, then called East Germany, south of Berlin, in a town called Brachstedt, which is south of Berlin and north of Halle, uh, about eleven kilometers out of Halle. Um, I remember little things like a four-year-old would remember. For example, there was a walkway between 
the barn and the house. It was just it was just like maybe ten feet away. It had cracks in it upon which I stumbled often, and so I remember cracks <laughs> uh, in in the sidewalk. Um, the smell of the animals. Um, that's about it. There's not a lot of memories. Um, you had an older brother at that point? An older brother and a, and daddy, and a younger brother. Mm -hmm. uh, the younger brother was a year and a half younger, so he and I were almost uh, inseparable. We grew up together and uh, did everything together, and the older brother was uh, nasty and mean and a typical older brother. Well, yeah. yeah. Um, you might say he was trying to lord it over you? Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what older brothers, that's yeah. their job. Yeah. It seems. And so, how old were you when your family emigrated to Canada? Uh, I was five years old when we came to, to Canada. Um, Dad was in trouble uh, with uh, the authorities in, in his district in East Germany. Uh, he stood up at the town councils and uh, accused people of being inefficient, of being unfair, of favoring certain people and not favoring others. Uh, and so um, he was in danger of being uh, eliminated as a, as a citizen. Uh, I do remember them talking about uh, and, uh, this and then being very tense at a certain time. They had to get away from the windows. Uh, this is in East Germany now, because the village supposedly was spying on each other and so they were making plans to escape from East Germany and uh, in order to make their plans they had to stand, stand in the center of the room uh, and make their plans and make sure nobody heard them because there could have been um, people outside the windows. This is what they what they talked about. Sort of informers. Informers, yeah. You know everyone was trying to get as much favor from the authorities as possible. You know so if you had if you had the uh, the best wishes of the uh, of the authorities, you'd get more of everything: bricks to build your house, uh, food, um, work opportunities, uh, and, and and so on. So it was really important to people to to be as uh, what would you call it as as uh, as friendly as possible to the authorities. Dad, of course, was a person who stood out from that, and so he was in trouble. And uh, so they hatched a plan to get out of uh, uh, East Germany, a very dangerous plan, but it, it, it worked. You and know. you said they hatched a plan. Now, yes. who would they have been? Just Mom and Dad. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, I mean, it was very, very difficult to talk to anybody else, and, uh, and uh, so they had to do this on their own. And so how did they accomplish that? In, in those days, 52, 53, uh, it, was, it was allowable to visit West Berlin if half your family stayed home. So everyone or many people had relatives in West Berlin. Uh, and so what you, what, what you could do is leave half the family at home, get on a train, go to West Berlin for the day, and then, and then come back. Uh, and the plan was that Dad would take... Uh, my older brother, mom would take the two younger brothers, dad would take one train and go to West Berlin and mom would take a second train the other way uh, and then they'd meet in West Berlin. And uh, mom and mom took uh, me and my brother uh, and uh, I remember uh, being on the train, I remember mom being extremely uh, nervous and worried uh, but trying to be calm at the same time, but you know, you can sense when your mother's not <laughs> feeling right. And uh, uh, there were soldiers walking up and down the aisles, there were German shepherd dogs walking up and down the aisles, and mom was forever thinking, okay, this is it, now they're going to ask for my our, our, our contact number in, in Brachstedt back home, and that'll be the end of this, this adventure. And uh, what would have happened had they been caught uh, is that they both would have been uh, accused of treason and we, we would have been orphans. Uh, luckily we made it into West Berlin and I do remember a lot of little silly things about the refugee camp in West Berlin. Uh, 
things like, for example, uh, uh, the airport hangar in which we lived, um, that there was straw on the floor, there were wires upon which people hung blankets, the blankets became the walls, so that was our little room, a wall of blankets with straw on the floor, that's where we lived. And the entire building was filled with these little cubicles made out of walls, um, and there was a communal water thing, water basin, and it was just a, just a great big running water thing where you go get your water and, and so on. Um, if I might just ask mm -hmm. a question at this point, you um, did your family leave everything behind after that trip by train, two different trains, yes. to West Germany? Yes, they did. So you were going to a refugee camp, we were not actually to... visiting a relative? Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. uh, there were no relatives there. So uh, that was the cover story? Yeah, that's right. So they went to a refugee camp, uh, and every day, I was told, every day Dad would go to the various um, uh, embassies. So he went to the American embassy and, and filed, and the Canadian embassy, and the Argentinian embassy, and the Brazilian embassy, and the Mexican embassy. And, uh, and he filed as a refugee, hoping that someone in these countries that he went to uh, would adopt us, uh, and as it happened, after about six months living in the refugee camp, we were adopted by a family in Medicine Hat. Not How a family, a church, by a church. How interesting. And it was the, so. the Grace Baptist Church, which uh, was... As it turned out, being a Baptist had an advantage? Exactly, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, they adopted us, and uh, um, the government of Canada paid our way, and we repaid, my parents repaid the way over in under two years. Um, and by that time, in two years, Dad learned enough English to... Uh, to, to get along in, in Medicine Hat. Um, Mom didn't. She took a lot longer to <laughs> learn English. So is there anything else, Peter, you can tell us about that refugee camp just before we get you on the trip to Canada? What, As was a it child, a, I had... Was it a large lot of people there or... Constant flow of And people. conditions were... From my perspective as a child, it was wonderful. You're free. You could just go and walk and play and meet people and. Uh, and you hadn't been able to do that in Poland or East or, Germany. No, we hadn't. Been well, able you to weren't. Do that. I'm yeah. sorry. I keep thinking you were born in Poland. No. so forgive me. Yeah. So in East Germany, you weren't able to have that sort of freedom. No, no. It was it was really tense, really tense and nasty. Mm -hmm. Is my impression now? Maybe I'm having that impression from my parents, uh, but I don't rem remember friends or going to see people or visiting with relatives mm -hmm. or anything mm -hmm. like that. Uh, yeah, it was just, it was just a and dark And so the period. refugee camp had that. So what sort of games and things as a four or five year old were you playing in that camp? Uh, I really don't remember, but I'm imagining, because I, I, I think of it as sunny, warm, happy, uh, I don't remember what games I played or who I, but I'm sure there were children galore that we were running around with. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's, I can't so, say that much, yeah. Uh, you were adopted or what would be the right word to, to use that the Grace Baptist Church... Uh, what sponsored. Was, they sponsored, sponsored us, so they okay. guaranteed our uh, upkeep for a year. That was One their, year. yeah, that was the deal. So tell me about uh, your family's trip to Canada. Well, what I remember is uh, going to Hamburg, uh, getting on a great big ship that used to be a coal ship, and they had taken the various, uh, what you call great big areas in the ship and converted them into uh, bed, bed areas where they had bunk beds that were four high, mm -hmm. you know, four bunk beds. Um, it was dark because the place had been filled with coal. It was still filled with coal dust and <laughs> we, we lived in, uh, in that area uh, of, of the ship. Um, it was uh, very... Families kept together? Yes, they were. On the ship? Yeah. 
but but you didn't have your own cabin. It was just a great big hall filled with bunk beds. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was how a, did you achieve any privacy at all? I think most of the time people were in bed uh, ill from the from the from the uh, rough seas. And it was coal a, dust. Who knows? Yeah, it could have been coal yeah. dust too. But it it's uh, it was very very rough. Uh, and the one thing that mother tells me, and I, I concur with her, I, I wouldn't have had the words to put that together, uh, but everybody on the ship was sick. I mean, there was, there was, there was throwing up all the time, mm -hmm. constantly, all night, all day. Um, and she says, I was the only one that she know, knows of on the boat that didn't throw up. Hmm. I was in the bottom bunk, uh, and I kept seeing rivers of... <laughs> of vomit going past me and I tried to get away from that often by just going up uh, to the railing outside uh, and watching the ocean, watching the waves. Uh, I remember seeing a uh, ceiling whales or something like and, that. And you were how old at this point? Five. Five, okay yeah. so you were on your own on the ship where you had to go up to the rails. Yeah. Somebody went long? No. I was. I remember standing by myself and feeling really good to get out of that black hole, and I did that quite often. Mm -hmm. But huge waves and miserable conditions, and a lot of sick people. And, so rough crossing. Yeah. Um, and so you came to Canada, and where did you? We landed in Montreal, mm -hmm. and uh, in Montreal we got onto the train, and the train was a steam locomotive train. Uh, it was May, but it was really nice and warm. Um, and I do remember getting off off the boat, and there was there were people there with typewriters and so on, and they decided what our name was going to be. So we are Mueller's, M-U-E-L-L-E-R, but we could have been Miller's or Muller's. Uh, just depends on who was typing at that point. Mm -hmm. So, and your father had no say in the spelling or the use of his own name. I think it was a rush job. They just rushed you through. You know, we had no documents. Uh, uh, oh. the, the 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 documents that we had were uh, just one church kind of uh, a little a little notebook from the church, handwritten, and uh, you know that's all we still have to this day. I don't have a birth certificate. That I am still like in the family. Yes, I Good. have it. Yeah. Good. Um, but yeah, so they just, and, and, you know, in German it's, it's M-U with two dots on it, L-L-E-R, and so that, that U with the two dots, um, could become an I, or just a U with no dot, mm -hmm. so Muller's would be the same as Mueller's, and Miller's would be the same as Mueller's, and so, anyway. No um, attempt to anglicize at that point. No, some and yet some people, people some, some people, people did. did. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And then we got on a train, and the the, and again, this is a five-year-old's memories. I love the train because of the steady rhythmic, uh, you know, what would you call it? The choo-choo of the train mm -hmm. <laughs> was just beautiful, just wonderful, and uh, it was warmish. So the windows of this uh, of the of the of the train car were open. And I loved the smoke and the steam coming into the, you know, it was just, mm -hmm. I love that. It was just uh, a, a memory. And I think smell uh, sticks with you, you know, mm -hmm. so the smell of the train, the, the, the smell of the steam, uh, it was wonderful when they went through tunnels and the whole cabin filled with, with locomotive uh, smell and, and steam and coal dust and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, so that's that's basically what I remember about the train. Your mother must have been greatly relieved. I'm sure she was. I'm sure she was. Mm -hmm. It was just an amazing thing for them, you know, to, to get away from from the danger of East Germany. Uh, and so meals on the train, or did you pack lunches, or what I'm happened? sure we How didn't did have you? anything. Because you would sure be several that. days, would you not? be on the train from Montreal to... Oh, it must have been weeks. Yeah, maybe two weeks. I have no idea. Okay. But, uh... You probably remember what you ate. I don't. Oh. <laughs> I don't remember what we ate. <laughs> I think, I, I do have to say that I was probably traumatized uh, to the point where I don't have a lot of memories. You mm -hmm. know, a lot of people have pretty distinct memories of 
of games, like you, you ask mm -hmm. about the games mm -hmm. we played, I don't. Uh, or the foods we ate, I don't. I don't remember. Uh, it must have been traumatic, you know? I'm sure it was. So, you know, mom and dad had built their own house in, in, uh, in Brachstedt. Uh, they had, you know, devised a successful farm existence. It was, it was hand-built, the house and the barn and everything else. And to leave all of that and go to a place you knew nothing about with three children. And only a small booklet. Exactly. And no money. Like, it was just, you know, we, I have to give my parents kudos for, for having had the courage to do that. I would say. Quite an amazing thing. So to continue with your story, Peter, um, when you arrived in Medicine Hat, uh, what memories do you have of arriving and or people that might have been there? I'm assuming that we were met by the ministers and members of the church because it was a church-sponsored, uh, we were a church-sponsored family. They housed us uh, at the old folks' home. What is it called? Haven of Rest in those days? At the airport? At the airport. And it was a... Uh, um, we did. It, it was just a little room, a one room for the for the five of us, uh, until they found a, a, a house for us. So we lived in the Haven of Rest for I would say about a month, mm -hmm. um, in with all the old people, the wheelchairs and the smells of an old old folks' home, as we call it called it then. Um, and uh, I remember not being very happy there at all. Um, uh, just uh, memories of wheelchairs and urine is is uh, basically. <laughs> and wait a minute, you were right across the road from the airport. No aircraft in your memory. No. Coming and going. No. Okay. Hmm. Uh, and eventually, uh, the church found us a, a place on Elm Street, across from Elm Street School, directly across from Elm Street School. A little house. I think the house is still there. I've walked past it recently. Um, and uh, it had two bedrooms, one for mom and dad and one for the three of us boys, mm -hmm. uh, and a basement with a trap door. Uh, eventually, I think about two months later, another family arrived uh, and we uh, were asked to accommodate them in the basement, which was a dirt basement with a trap door. They were a young, newly married couple and uh, uh, they didn't last long because um, uh, newly married couples and three children upstairs do not mix well. The couple that was there living mm -hmm. in your basement, were they <coughs> German speakers? They were German as well, yeah, mm -hmm. new immigrants. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that was May, and what I, what I do remember very distinctly, it's, this is surprising now that I say it, but I do remember uh, playing the entire summer with children who lived on Elm Street. There was the Hauk family. I don't remember their first names now, but there was the Hauk family, and uh, we made friends immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, language didn't seem to be an issue. Uh, I spoke no English, of course, and they spoke no German, and yet we're, we, we became friends. I remember playing cowboys and Indians with them. I remember chasing them down the street with a with a sword at one point, a wooden sword, and, and the same thing would happen to me, and it was all just absolutely wonderful fun. Mm -hmm. Good memories. So, yeah, and I, I'm puzzled as to how we could have communicated. I, I know that I spoke and, and said things and suggested we do this or do that, and they must have done the same, but we were speaking two different languages and yet we understood each other. And were your brothers involved with you in that? My younger brother was, mm -hmm. my older brother wasn't. He found other friends. Okay. Um, the funny thing, this is, this is something that should be looked into as well. Uh, the funny thing is that we were the best of friends. We were inseparable. We spent the entire summer. We, uh, even at age five, uh, walked from Elm Street down to, to the creek. I guess it was Ross Creek, uh, looking for beavers and looking for things and, uh, you know, not a care in the world, uh, a wonderful time. Uh, I do remember uh, getting used to running up and down the streets barefoot. Nobody wore shoes in the summertime. 
which was uh, interesting. So when school started, you had to wear shoes, and that was really uncomfortable. Uh, I do remember that. Uh, when school started, this is what I was going to say, suddenly the friends went to the Catholic school, we went to Elm Street school, and suddenly we were enemies just because they were Catholic and we were not. Mm. And I, I, it's so sad that that, that you know, uh, I remember uh, mom and dad encouraging us not to play with the Catholic kids uh, because they're Catholic, they're papists, and you know that sort of stuff was was was. So more going of a on. religious thing than an ethnic thing. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was interesting. Yeah, and um, and so at school, how did that work out for you? How did you adjust to the school when you started? Uh, yeah, so I started school, my birthday is in October, I started school at f age five, uh, grade one, and I knew not a word of English, not a clue, although I saw the alphabet uh, around the, you know, the classroom, A, B, C, all the way around, and for each uh, letter there was an image, so A was for apple, uh, and I, I do remember saying, oh, that's an A. That's an apfel. Apfel is German for apple, and uh, I, I think that made uh, that made learning English suddenly really, really quite easy. You know. Was you, your grade you, one teacher helpful? Don't remember a thing about the teacher or, <laughs> or the classroom or or anything. Okay. Not a thing. I do remember, sadly, uh, being yelled at by other students during recess and lunchtime, being yelled at uh, in a derogatory way uh, and they were yelling the phrase DP mm -hmm. and DP I had no clue what it was but it must have been a terrible thing because they beat me up and uh, uh, wouldn't let me play uh, with them at all because I was a DP whatever a DP is you know that now don't you? I do now mm -hmm. know that yeah um, but that a lot of displaced people came to Medicine Hat yeah were sponsored and came to Medicine Hat yeah. Was your father working? Did he go to work right away he got, after he, he had a, he, he got a job right away building sidewalks with uh, Paul Stober, I think, is was the contractor mm -hmm. at the time. Paul Stober was a member of the church, and he uh, hired new immigrants, uh, and that was very kind of him. And uh, uh, so that was my dad's first job. He eventually left uh, and got a was able to get a job at the flour mill, I think the Ogilvy flour mill, mm -hmm. and had that job for I think five or six years. Uh, Mum also got uh, jobs cleaning houses or cleaning motels and hotel rooms. Mm -hmm. So they were able to pay off their debt to the government and to the church, I guess, uh, very, very quickly. And that was sort of one of those, those, those principles don't ever want to be in debt, you know, and, and owe money and all that sort of stuff. And so, so got... did you become members of Grace Baptist oh, Church? Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. And it was German. It was a German Baptist church. Okay. Um, and Sunday school and all of that? It was German, yeah. yeah. And so that was part of a, a comfort um, condition, I think, uh, in our first few years. Did your dad um, become a leader in that church? He was, and he was a choir director and um, all that sort of thing. Yeah, music was very big for him. Um, I have to say, I'm not sure where this would fit in, but I have to say that uh, I feel really badly that I don't have much information to share about this whole thing. And I don't have this information because of my... Hmm, my treatment um, as an immigrant, I was ashamed of being German. I was ashamed of being uh, an immigrant and didn't want, therefore, to know about it. I just, mm -hmm. uh, I think there was something in my, my makeup as I grew older who didn't, that just simply didn't want to know. So when mom and dad actually tried to tell us stories, uh, I didn't want to hear about it. I just didn't, I was embarrassed. You were uh, busy assimilating. Yeah. That's true. That's actually true. But um, how did you go about doing that, Peter? I remember there were a couple of friends. Uh, one friend that I, I I just happened to remember his name, John Bittner. 
Uh, and so once you meet one or two friends, then you start to, you know, uh, acclimatize and uh, assimilate. Um, how did that happen? I think Bittner, John Bittner was an outcast. I was an outcast. Two outcasts find each other and mm -hmm. uh, the world is much suddenly a bigger and friendlier Did you place. join Boy Scouts or any of the groups that young tried lads to, would be involved in? Yeah, I tried to join um, a Little League Baseball. Uh, I think this may have been grade four or five. By that time I was trying to get in there and, and become a Canadian-ish kind of person. So Little League Baseball, but I didn't make the team because I'd never been given opportunities to throw a ball or catch a ball or, you know, mm -hmm. uh, didn't even know what baseball was, but I wanted to join something <laughs> to become Canadian. Uh, so I didn't make the team and that's a, yeah, a little bit of a black mark in my, my back. So let's past. fast forward. Yeah. Uh, you know, you must have had hopes and dreams. Obviously you were hoping to assimilate and dreaming about your future and how you might project forward. Um, so hmm. let's talk about your career. I know you're a retired high school teacher and, you know, very popular one at that from what I've heard. And so obviously, uh, things worked out. I had some very good teachers along the way. Uh, I, I realized probably in grade six, that I was smart enough to start thinking about university, uh, and so and so uh, that became sort of a, a thing that I knew I was going to do. And our parents really did push. They encouraged that at home. They they really pushed uh, reading uh, and and success in school uh, and university. Mm -hmm. We were all going to go to university, and we all did. Mm -hmm. All all of us went to university. It's quite an accomplishment. Yes. Um, so yeah, I think probably by grade five or six, I realized, oh, okay, this is this is the game, and I think I'm I'm going to be okay at it. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, had a very very vivid imagination. Knew I could uh, tell stories and and uh, uh, learn things. Always tried to figure out how things worked. Uh, even sitting in church, bored out of my mind. Uh, I looked at the ceiling and tried to figure out exactly how a ceiling stayed up in a tall building like that and instead of listening to the sermon I would draw pictures of cantilevered uh, structures that held, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know, I, I had a fertile mind and that led me into university and, mm -hmm. yeah. And where did you go to uni? Uh, Edmonton. The, another, this is, has nothing to do with being a German from Russia, of course, but when I was in grade 10, uh, I uh, had a girlfriend. That is, uh, and that's another thing. I, I, I suddenly realized that I wasn't ugly. Uh, right around grade 9 or grade 10, <laughs> I wasn't ugly. Uh, I had been ugly. I had fallen off the, <laughs> off the, uh, the monkey bars at school. I had been hanging in the center of the monkey bars and let go and smashed my teeth on the bottom bar. Mm -hmm. And so from grades six to about grade eight, I had uh, no front teeth. They were knocked out and uh, so it was kind of ugly. <laughs> and, uh, and then I got my teeth fixed and suddenly there were girls who were uh, interested in hanging out with me. Mm -hmm. So I had a girlfriend by the time I was in grade 10 my parents didn't like that, uh, but we we did our thing until about grade 11, and then I realized this wasn't going to go anywhere. We're, we're, this is a dangerous situation. Uh, and so when mom and dad wanted to send me away from home, I said, yeah, yeah, I want to go away from home, and uh, went to the church Bible school in Edmonton. It was called the Christian Training Institute at that time and took my grade 12 year in Edmonton uh, in preparation for, for the U of A. And that'd be a whole new world in Edmonton. After Medicine Hat, it was that'd absolutely be a whole wonderful. new world. Absolutely wonderful, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so I graduated at the age of 17. Uh, and you always planned to be a teacher? I always planned to be a teacher. There was 
a, a grade nine teacher who uh, made a huge impression on me. He's still around. He and I actually taught together at Cresnites High. Um, he was a math teacher. I was a social teacher. Uh, but uh, John Weatherhead uh, was my inspiration for becoming a teacher. Mm -hmm. He was young at that time. He was single. He was as free as the breeze and told us stories about his life in BC and on top of that was a good teacher. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a human uh, and I thought, okay, that's great. You can be human and be uh, you know, involved in the world and in your subject matter at the same time. And, and so I, I resolved to become a teacher as well. Yes. Um, so a bit of a role model was John Weatherhead. He was, he mm -hmm. was, yeah. That's wonderful. And now I'm going to fast forward because um, time is always an issue for these uh, interviews. Um, I know that you are involved uh, writing for the Mesnat News. Do you want to touch on that for a moment? Um, that seems to be particularly uh, important to you, to... Uh, to be one of their oh, I, I think writers. that it, that's I was a social studies teacher for 33 years and um, I was involved in helping to write the curriculum of, uh, of uh, the high school social studies I was involved in uh, um, the philosophy of the social studies curriculum which centered around teaching critical thinking um, and um, and so as a teacher of social studies 30 in particular I um, tried to get students uh, not just to prepare for the exam but to be very very actively engaged in deciding what was the best way for people to live together mm -hmm. how should we build a society and so my classes were discussion oriented and uh, and um, sometimes I'd play the devil's advocate. I'd pretend to be conservative. And, uh, and all the kids would say, yeah, yeah, that sounds right. And then I'd come back the next day and say, you guys let me get away with this and this and this. Uh, you guys are grade 12. You're supposed to be critical thinkers. You have to challenge authority. You don't just accept it. And you know, that kind of thing. So... Um, Challenging authority, you know, isn't that one of the key uh, characteristics <laughs> of your father? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. If, if we had a couch here, we could do a, a session, <laughs> a Freudian session on that, <laughs> that topic. It's um, just interesting because, uh, yeah. Also, I know that you've been involved recently in your retirement. I don't know how we can call it retirement because uh, the book, that the project that just uh, was launched last week, last weekend, mm -hmm. uh, you were greatly involved in. Mm -hmm. So again a liter a literary uh, project yeah tell us about that um that was the seeing medicine hat through the eyes of children project which is uh, was just released last week this book mm -hmm. and these teachers have been working to collect children's drawings and children's writings or responses to field trips that they've they had made in the medicine hat area and uh, they, so for, these teachers spent four years collecting this data. There was a pile of it there. They uh, uh, itemized it, cataloged it, and then they needed somebody to help write and put it together. And coordinate so, it. Okay. Well, I, or, yeah, so I worked with them coordinating it uh, and, and then writing the, the adults' portions of the book, mm -hmm. which was... Such fun. It was tremendous fun. But back to your original question about the uh, newspaper articles, I saw myself as a person who would continue my role as a social studies teacher in the community mm -hmm. through my articles. So you write an article, uh, you want to upset some people, you want to encourage other people, and uh, so yeah, I, I, I want to do a little bit of a controversy um, awakening activity through my articles. Mm -hmm. And every now and then that works. Well, really as you had mentors yeah. in Mr. Weatherhead, I'm sure you're becoming a mentor to other younger or even members of the community. And I want to thank you, Peter, because this, this interview has been absolutely uh, fascinating. Um, <laughs> 
your own personal point of view has been so interesting, and I think it's going to be a real asset for our uh, information on families that did emigrate to Canada from parts of Europe. And do you have anything you want to add before you, we close? I do. All right. I, Let's uh, get that into the record. I had completely forgotten about these tapes that my younger brother, the youngest child of the family, had made with my father uh, probably about 10 years ago. So they're on tapes, and I don't have a tape player. And uh, again, I have to admit to being disinterested in this just because of my past. Mm -hmm. But here are eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven tapes uh, where father talks about uh, 1917, his grandparents coming to Poland, or he says Russia. Um, and it, it, it's a chron chronology from 1917 straight up to coming to Canada. Mm -hmm. I should have listened to these. I haven't yet, uh, for for personal reasons. Uh, but uh, they are a valuable resource. I now intend to actually sit down, listen to them, and if not transcribe them, then make the story up in my own in my mm -hmm. own fashion. I think that's wonderful. But uh, yeah, a gold mine of information for this particular project. Good, and uh, we're hoping that. Uh Perhaps at another time we can have another interview where you can share those stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not sure when, but yes. Yeah. That'd be well, great. I know you're a busy guy. Uh, mm -hmm. Now you're out on your uh, bicycle getting ready for summer and all of those marathons and things. So yes. thanks again for spending this time with us. My pleasure. Thank you.